concerned uh, there has been some attempts to try to weaken the government as far as Ukraine was concerned and to uh, also stop our response to Putin. And this became stronger when the it was a question of, of, of supporting the debt and the desire to go forward together progressively started extinguishing itself and then to be able to act efficiently speedily in the interest of the country was becoming more and more difficult as i've said at the council of ministers the vote last thursday so the end of this uh, solidarity pact that kept us together and not to vote loyalty in a government you belong to is a clear political gesture, which has an obvious meaning. And it's not possible to ignore it, because after all, that would mean that you'd be ignoring Parliament. It's not uh, possible to contain it, because it would mean that anybody could repeat that. And it's not possible. <clears throat> Non è possibile it's not possible to minimize this because after all it's after months of ultimatums the only path if you want to stay together still stay together is to build this pact from the beginning once again And the only path, if you want to stay together, is to build this pact right from the beginning with courage, with altruism, with credibility, and to ask this of Italians after all the mobilization of the past few days by citizens' associations and is without precedent, and it's impossible to ignore it. And the third sector, school, universities, the world of economy, professions, uh, companies, the sports world, uh, we're all involved. We're talking about uh, a support uh, which is uh, not merited, but I'm very grateful for it. I, the two appeals have particularly struck me. The first one from 2,000 unions. Unionists, trade unionists. Autorità. And also authorities that are used to having confrontations or deal with the problems within their communities. And the second appeal from the health staff, the heroes of the pandemic, and as far as they're concerned, we have an enormous amount of gratitude. So this request for stability means that we all have to decide whether it's possible to recreate the conditions under which the government can govern. And that really is at the heart of our discussion today. And this is what we have to look at. Italy needs a government which is able to work with efficiency and speedily on four levels. First of all, resilience. We want to be able to improve our growth long term, to create opportunities for young people, women, to make sure there's, less, there's equilibrium between North and South. And at the end of the year, we should be able to achieve 55 objectives, which will allow us to have 
another 19 billion euros. And we're looking at fundamental themes, so for example, the inf digital infrastructure, tourism, the creation of universal housing, research, of research grants, and also to, in order to do so, we have to do this seriously with our citizens, as far as our citizens are concerned, and European par partners. We don't know how to spend this money with efficiency and honesty. We'll be able to not ask for other instruments in order to manage the crisis. Uh, the advance, uh, advances mean we have to realize uh, uh, many investments from the railways uh, to large band for craters. Uh, and we have to make sure we can have to realize all the projects that we, in fact, had uh, achieve, wanted to achieve with the help of local communities. We want to get rid of useless bureaucracy, which often stops the development of the country. We've got to make sure that uh, the communes has, have all the necessary instruments in order to overcome possible problems. And uh, currently, we have to really introduce reforms quickly and also investment means that we can actually then have full employment. Uh, and as far as public tender is concerned, we hope to be able to quickly have public works and also have instruments to uh, fight against corruption. We've got to make sure also that we control the mafia. And the best way in order to uh, remember Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino And it's the best way to honor the memories of uh, Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino and the men and women who were cruelly killed. And as far as the code with regard to tenders has been approved. And so that was, of course, the Prime Minister of Italy, Mario Draghi, speaking in the Italian Senate. Now, he did not stay whether he would stay or go, but we understood from the fact that he said he is ready to rebuild the coalition, the governing coalition, that uh, he also mentioned the outpouring support he got in the last few days, that he's possibly not looking at going now. Now, we'll follow, of course, the speech live. It's still going on. We're expecting it to last another 15, 20 minutes. Certainly the markets, if we look at the markets on the back of that, seem to be taking it as the Prime Minister ready to look at the arithmetic to get enough support, of course, from uh, the Senate to try and rebuild this coalition and push the reforms through. I was listening to the speech with Fabrizio Pagani. He's global head of economics and capital markets strategy at Musenic, former uh, Italian Treasury official. So he understands the intricacies, of course, of being in Parliament, of looking at the Senate, what Mario Draghi could or could not do. Fabrizio, as always, thank you so much for being with me. So we're looking at the speech together. And just by saying, look, he's ready to rebuild the coalition he i guess has been persuaded to stay for a little bit longer to push the reforms through is that your interpretation that's my interpretation thank you for inviting me first of all um there is a, a bit of a nuance i think he's saying more than rebuilding the coalition is rebuilding the pact underlying supporting the coalition because basically uh, in the first part of his speeches uh, has, has listed the, the, the achievement of the government, which are indeed quite impressive, started with the vaccination campaign and the, you know, the, the next generation in you and all, and all that. But then it says that the, the action of the government have been somehow worn out by the 
the differences and the and somehow a sort of internal opposition within the within yeah. the large majority, which is still 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 enjoys. Let let me remind you know that the, the this government has a majority of around 80 percent of the parliament. So, so he has it's quite numbers wrong. to stay. It he was just because he it, it was no longer stay. unity that he exactly. wanted to, to there, stay. Exactly. There, there, there is too there is too much infight within the government within with, 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 among the parties uh, of supporting the government, and let me say also within some of the parties uh, uh, supporting the government. This is, all, this is also, in, in a certain way, natural because also this is a, te a technocratic government yeah. and we are approaching elections. So party, you know, parties are scrambling for position in order to have a, a political space and political gains in view of the elections which are due next year, early next year. We, we both followed him, of course, as he was also ECB president very closely. I've never very heard closely. him raise his voice before. I mean, this was kind of listening to your dad for the first time swearing. <laughs> is this a different kind of Mario Draghi? Does he push through the reforms more aggressively to make sure that they get the funding from the EU? Yeah, perhaps, perhaps, indeed. It, 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 also in his tone and his, uh, you know, uh, undertone, uh, I think he's moving a bit from his more technocratic, cold, uh, cold uh, central banker uh, uh, attitude to a more political, indeed, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of someone who's addressing uh, uh, the, 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 the parliament, and a parliament which is, uh, uh, you know, divided and at a certain time need, needs leadership. So yeah. sometimes, you know, to raise, to raise voice can, can help in, in establishing that, that leadership, especially Again. when it's coming from someone with such an authority. Yeah, and again, so this is about not only, of course, the disbursements of the funds by the EU, but this is also the tools that the ECB would look to put in place for this anti-fragmentation uh, tool. If you're an investor right now, or if you're the ECB, you look at Italy and you say, okay, I have Mario Draghi, but for how long? Do we go back to square one in January of 2023 with possible snap elections? Um, I think this is a very delicate moment for the ECB from, from, you know, from several points of view point of view, the, you know, the, 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 the rate hikes and, and, and the inflation and, and all that. And then there is the discussion about this anti-fragmentation mechanism. They call it now uh, uh, transmission protection mechanism, yes. as far as, far as I as I understand. And of course, there is, no, there is no doubt that Italy is and will be the major beneficiary of that, of that mechanism. So in Somehow, it shouldn't be like that, but somehow internal domestic Italian politics counts when we take that, that decision and when the ECB will, 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 will look into that. Uh, you know, paradoxically, uh, if, if Mario Draghi goes, Italy will need that mechanism even more, yeah. you know, so it will be it will more, more, more in need when it, de it deserves it less, yeah. because of course the, uh, Draghi with his, uh, um, you know, with his, with, with his credibility and yeah. ensures the stability which Italy needs. For, uh, Fabrizio, we understand through the polls that if we were to go to election in Italy in the next couple of months, there would be a right, a coalition of the right with uh, Meloni, Madame Meloni, that would be, of course, on, on the furthest of the right. In the past, she has been Eurosceptic. Do Italians win elections if they're seen as Eurosceptic? Would this really go against some of the values of the European Union? Could we talk about Ital exit, or is that a thing of the past? I think in the past, all the, 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 the right-wing parties in Italy have been very Eurosceptic. I think this is, this is changing and, and, and continues to change. And probably, you know, if they if they if they get into power, that will be that that, that will 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 move, will move again. Um, the, the, there are some important elements which have been building up in the last in the last months, including the, the positioning vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the Ukrainian war and and and, 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 and so on. Uh, obviously, Italy will be a more, let's say, a more challenging partner in, 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 in Europe. But I don't think there, is, there will be any discussion about Italy exit yeah. or, you know, Euro exit or... Or anything like that. Fabrizio, thanks so much, as always, Fabrizio Pagani, their global head of economics and capital market strategy at Musenic, and he stays with us. Now, up next, we'll have plenty more on, for example, Netflix. Now, we had some encouraging number from Netflix. It's actually gaining in today's trading session. This is after losing fewer subscribers than expected. We'll have plenty more on that. Look at that, gaining 7% as we speak. And then we also look at Gazprom saying it will resume flows through Nord Stream tomorrow. Europe targeting a major cut in demand though. So we'll have plenty more on that next. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition of Francine Lacqua Hill in Rome. Now, the EU is set to propose a voluntary 15% cut in natural gas use by member states starting next month. The continent will face an enormous challenge this winter, ensuring that there are enough gas supplies to fuel power generators. Now, energy giant Gazprom will restart gas exports through its Nord Stream 2 pipeline to Europe on Thursday, but at reduced capacity. So let's get straight to our person on the ground, our expert in all things gas, Bloomberg's John Inger, Inger rather, who's in Brussels. John, so first of all, how likely is it that flows will restart through Nord Stream 1 on Thursday tomorrow? Well, of course, in the current times, uh, everything is always up in the air, but we think flows will restart. President, Russian President Vladimir Putin has signaled as such uh, that they will restart, but um, albeit with some conditions. So we, we don't exactly know by how much flows will resume. It could be 20%, it could be a bit more. There's still um, a lot of fighting over a gas turbine, which helps push gas through the pipe. Um, and that seems to be a key bone of contention. But of course, the EU isn't wasting any time. Um, it's preparing for a worst case scenario of a full cutoff. Um, and so today we will be getting a plan on how the bloc plans to reduce energy demand, which is a key side of the equation and one that up until now it hasn't really addressed. Thank you so much, John. John Anger there in Brussels. We're back with Fabrizio Pagani from Musenic. Fabrizio, we're talking a little bit before, of course, about this cost of living, the inflationary pressures that are not only taking hold of Italy, but the, the rest of Europe. First of all, is it a given that there's some kind of gas embargo from Russia, or do you think there's still room to maneuver? Um, I think we should prepare you know, uh, as there is a full gas embargo. That's what yeah. we should do. So th this is plan B. What does that mean for Italy? Is, is the, you know, the Italian government and the energy minister able to secure side deals to make sure that Italy, one of the most affected, of course, by this gas embargo, can be somehow, if not protected, do better than otherwise? Italy, the Italian government has already done much on that. You know, there, there has been this recent uh, mission to, to Algeria by, by Draghi himself and the, and the minister of energy, Cingolani. Uh, it, it, Algeria has become now the major gas provider to Italy. Yeah. It's, replace, it's replacing Russia by, you know, by 40%. Yeah. Um, and I think other, other geographical sources are, 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 in, are you know, uh, coming up, Azerbaijan, but also South, sub saharan Africa. Uh, ENI has been very, very active in, 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 that, in that sense. So I think in, in some, some way Italy can become a hub of gas for the rest, for the rest of Europe. Uh, we, we need to make sure that, you know, bottlenecks are, are, are solved and that also the, from a regulatory point of view, there is really a free flowing of, 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 of gas acro ac across the continent. So there are technical and infrastructure issues, but yeah. also regulatory ones. At, at what price? So is inflation in Italy and Germany going to be much higher than anywhere else in Europe? It, it, in, in, in Italy and in German inflation is, is, is basically due to uh, energy price, energy yeah. costs, as, uh, uh, as you know. You know, it's, ga it's, it's gas and, and oil. Oil is a, is, a, is a global market, and mm -hmm. we have seen that there has been there has been you know a drop. There is a lot of, uh, of volatility, and does not really depend on on mm -hmm. so, so much on what the Italian or the German government can do. As far as gas is concerned, I think indeed uh, there are three things which can be done. One more more sources and geographical yeah. sources, diversification in, in in the energy mix, so more renewables. There have been a lot of more renewables in Italy since the beginning of the years, thanks also to the simplification process which has been done by the government. And the third, is some conservation. I think yeah. we, we need we, we need we need some measures which 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 in, in facilitate. Let's say you know nudge a bit no. the, the, the consumer to, 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 to uh, consume less and less. Um, Fabrizio, talk to me a little bit about central bank expectations. So if you look at the ECB, I mean, it's incredible some of the market moves that we've seen. I think there's 50% of the market that now expects a 50 basis point hike tomorrow. I was on a panel, um, you know, asking Christine Lagarde about this. She, yeah. she was very muted on it just two weeks ago. Do you think they'll go for 50? I don't know. Frankly, I don't know. I'm a bit puzzled. Um, I think whatever they do, they need to communicate that. In the last meeting in June, they uh, communicate, they wrote that there will be a 25 basis yeah. point. Um, I think, you know, anything which could surprise market, yeah, uh, it, it, it would be detrimental. I think we need, we, we need, we need stability, we need, stay, we need to stay the course. 
and we need a clear uh, 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 path towards the rate hikes. But, but if the market reprices for them, it means that it's been communicated somehow, or no? Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Let's see what what the markets does tomorrow if they do it. Okay, let's see traders hide under their desks. Yeah, 50% is half of the market, then yeah. Yeah, so half, half has it wrong, Fabrizio. <laughs> thank you so much, Fabrizio Pagani, their global head of economics and capital market strategy at Musinic, joining us from a very very hot room. Now let's turn our attention to big tech. After losing more than a million customers in the first half of 2022, Netflix has a message for investors. It could have been worse. Now the leader in paid streaming. TV TV lost 970,000 subscribers in the second quarter. That was less than half what Wall Street had feared. And that's thanks in large to large parts of a new season of Stranger Things, the service's most popular English language series. Well, such fan of Stranger Things is Alex Webb. He can't get enough of it. Right, Alex? And he joins us now to talk about lies, Netflix. So, lies Alex, what is now lies. Netflix getting right that they were getting wrong before? <laughs> lies? Well, uh, no, I, uh, Tom was saying earlier, Tom knows very well I'm not a big Net the Stranger Things <laughs> fan. But uh, the thing that's interesting, clearly, Net Stranger Things is a hit. And they were the expectations yesterday were very low. And in that sort of situation, any surprise to the upside tends to get quite well received by the market. That's certainly what we're seeing in the after hours trading. It spiked as much as 10% at one stage, the share price. It was up at about 5.5%. Well, there we go, seeing 7.5%, 7 a bit percent now. Uh, the expectation was for t it to lose 2 million subscribers. It only lost about a million. And it's telegraphing that it will have growth in this quarter, the next quarter that it reports. So, Alex, is, is, I mean, this is you know, a very basic assumption. But actually, if you have a show that everybody wants to watch, apart from Alex Webb, and it does very well, that's how you measure success. Do people actually subscribe to watch one single TV series? So one of the big problems that Netflix has is, is what's known as churn, i.e. people who join, but then they leave again. And the disadvantage, of course, that streaming services have compared to the classic cable contract is a cable contract might have been 18 months, two years in some instances. In the case of Netflix, you can ditch it every month if you so desire. And what some people do is they sign up for a, a, a show they want to see. The moment they've seen it, they churn out, they unsubscribe. Yeah. And that's accentuated by Netflix's approach, which basically dumps the whole series in one go and lets you um, watch it in, in one sitting. What they've done a little bit differently with Stranger Things is they split it into two, so they staggered the release. And the effect of that is that right. it should reduce churn to a certain extent. Alex, does price matter? So if you're subscribed to you know, Discovery, I don't know what else, like Sky, Netflix in the UK and others in Europe, do you cut when inflation you know comes do you cut all three or do you cut one like what you know what are subscription channels thinking well of course it, it, you know different for every household i think the expectation had been that netflix would sort of be the base layer that it's almost like the utility when it comes to streaming everybody has netflix they add something else on top of that we're starting to see that maybe that isn't quite the case it has been trying to increase prices to offset stagnating growth that might also have affected some of its growth. People have seen that it's more expensive, and so therefore they go elsewhere somewhere cheaper. Some of its competitors have an advantage in the sense, particularly of Apple TV Plus and Amazon Prime Video, which maybe aren't, don't have as compelling an offering as Netflix, but they, uh, their business model is different. Amazon wants people to subscribe so that then they buy things on Amazon.com, which a Prime subscription lets you do. Apple wants to make its devices stickier, yeah. to make, uh, if you can only Apple access to only mobile device in which you can access Apple TV Plus is an iPhone, then it incentivizes you to buy an iPhone, and that will be $1,000 of revenue every few years. So they have something of a competitive disadvantage when it comes to some of those rivals. Alex, thanks so much. Alex Webb there with the very latest on Netflix. Now, in the meantime, we go back to the markets. We did see some relief, certainly on Italian markets, not only fixed income, but equities in general after that speech by Mario Draghi in Parliament. Now, we're expecting some kind of confidence vote. It could come a little bit later. It could also come early into the evening. But overall, stocks are rising, speculation that the worst of the year's equity rap may be over. And this comes even as concern over the potential for a global downturn seems to be sparking hawkish central banks. In Italy, the situation is Mario Draghi talking about rebuilding a coalition. The thinking is there is that he's willing to stay. And that seems to be giving a bit of relief to the markets. He did talk about a four-point plan, so we'll go through that 
and see exactly what that means for the fragmentation tool. Fabrizio Pagani was reminding me it's no longer called a fragmentation tool. It's called something much more uh, fancy, like a transmission mechanism, which makes it more palatable to the hawks. And then, of course, it's also the disbursement of the funds from the Commission. Coming up, a fresh 40-year high for UK inflation, pressure on the Bank of England for a jumbo rate hike next month. We have plenty more on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi tells lawmakers that his fractured well, lawmakers, well, that his fractured governing coalition can be rebuilt. Italian bonds rally, the FTSE MIB pairs losses. Coming in hot, UK inflation hits 9.4%, intensifying the cost of living crisis. And Sea of Green, Netflix surges on better than expected subscriber numbers, boosting stocks. Well, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Rome, looking at the rooftops, looking at Italian politics, and frankly, melting. It's very hot, and uh, a lot of uh, the jokes around when you go to the cafeterias or the bars is actually what's going on in Parliament. Maybe the heat is also melting parts of their brains. Now, a fresh 40 year high for UK inflation. Consumer prices rose 9.4% from a year earlier, keeping pressure on the Bank of England to deliver a jumbo rate hike next month. Let's get more now. Now, Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. Lizzie, uh, good morning. So will the CPI print today, which 9.4 percent, I mean, it's high, it's very high, change the Bank of England's thinking? It's very high. It's just a very slight upside surprise. It hasn't rocked markets, but I have to say that's because markets already expected a 50 basis point hike from the Bank of England in August. The question is, will it convince the policymakers of the Monetary Policy Committee? Well, maybe, because it makes a persuasive case. It's driven by food and fuel, so it's going to hit consumers where it hurts, but it's also widespread, so it's likely to be resilient. And don't forget, Inflation in the UK is heading towards double digits in the fall, so this isn't even the peak. When you listen to the commentary out of the Bank of England recently, after the last decision, they said that they were prepared to act forcefully to return inflation to target. Just last night, Andrew Bailey said that 50 basis points were on the table. So when you throw in yesterday's jobs data, uh, the fact that firms' inflation expectations remain elevated, our economists at least do say, think that a jumbo rate hike is coming in August. And it would be the first in the bank's independent history. Yeah, I mean, a jumbo rate, you know, the Fed and I'm sure the ECB will take notice if they haven't done it themselves before. Lizzie, thanks so much. Lizzie Burden there looking at the UK. Now, today is also a crucial day, very crucial day in Italian politics here in Rome as a coalition government could collapse. Prime Minister Mario Draghi has been addressing lawmakers and has told the Senate that his coalition can be rebuilt. So let's get straight to a journalist and really expert in all matters parliamentarian. He's Francesco Becchis. Francesco, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, there's so many questions about what this means for the future, uh, what this means, of course, for the future of Mario Draghi and some of the reforms. How do you see this playing out? Mario Draghi stays, but for how long? Well, uh, Francine, thanks for having me. Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, we know that um, uh, Mr. Mario Draghi uh, today came to the parliament uh, with, uh, uh, and is willing to stay. Uh, he's speaking right now as we speak. And, and he said that he's willing to uh, stay where he is and to keep up with the reforms. But he needs, uh, of course, the support of all the uh, political parties that one year uh, ago gave their support to the uh, national unity government. Of course, um, as you said, there's a joke uh, today in Rome, we're not the only ones melting right here, but the politics <laughs> is melting too and the government. And uh, we'll see if there is a way out uh, for um, uh, Mr. Draghi or if actually the Five Star Movement will uh, turn back and and uh, gave that confidence both to the... But he doesn't need all the five-star movement, right? Just to make it clear, yeah. I mean, as long as he has enough of a majority, does he get weakened to a point where he can't put the reforms through that put the access to the EU funds at risk? Well, that's what uh, makes uh, this crisis really hard to explain to uh, abroad because uh, actually Mr. Draghi <laughs> I've has tried this and yeah. usually it's like in 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I, I saw that. Um, yeah, he doesn't need the Five Star Movement, but he says that uh, that was the mandate uh, one year ago to form a national unity government. And now he needs all the parties uh, to step up and support him. Um, Mr. Conte is unlikely to give uh, his uh, confidence vote, so we'll see if the League uh, and Mr. Salvini will try to save the government uh, and, uh, and give their support. 
Okay, if we go to elections, and you're really the expert in all of these, these like Italian politics, and again, if you're looking from abroad or an international investor, and you think, what, they have so many parties? The coalition is, is with, what, seven parties? I mean, could we actually see a coalition with the right that could be Eurosceptic, or is this a thing of the past? Well, it's not really a thing uh, from the past because we know that uh, the uh, centre-right coalition still uh, is uh, uh, a bit uh, Eurosceptic. The brothers of Italy uh, with uh, Giorgia Meloni uh, still have uh, are very uh, critical with the European Union. Uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, things changed this last year and uh, we have a very different right uh, from uh, two years ago when there was a league at the government. So we'll see. Uh, of course, the Brothers of Italy is uh, leading the polls and they yep. want to go to the yep. vote. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that Salvini and uh, Mr. Yep. Berlusconi will, will uh, still, I'm still evaluating what they're going to do this afternoon. So the Brothers of Italy basically to the, the right, I don't know whether you'd describe them far right or, you know, well, to, to the more of the right, certainly that what right. we have in the current coalition would get, what, 23 percent. What kind of policies would they put in place that would be an interest of an international investor? Well, uh, they've changed a lot uh, in the last years. Uh, Georgia Maloney now has opened uh, her party to the uh, business uh, environment. Uh, and uh, I have to say that she has very good ties with uh, the, the business and the industry in Italy. She's not the, the old uh, far right uh, leader that she, she used to be. So, uh, and also, uh, as regards the European Union, they have changed so much in uh, their agenda. They're willing to, to stay where they are. And in the, in the European Parliament, Giorgia Meloni is, is uh, uh, heading the uh, Conservative Party, mm -hmm. which is not as Eurosceptic as the uh, party where Mrs. Salvini is in Brussels. So, Can the Five Star Movement survive this? So, again, in Parliament, there's about 30 uh, parliamentarians that we understand could also look at forming their own party. We have the foreign minister, Mr. Di Maio, formerly a five star with his own party. I mean, how many parties of the five star party make up? It's like, you know, they're sprawling and having children. Yeah, we're well, still counting. I mean, uh, in the lower house, as you said, they, uh, it's, it's very likely that uh, uh, 20 or 30 parliamentarians will be uh, leaving the five star movement. But uh, I mean, uh, uh, today, the uh, the biggest challenge for Mr. Conte is to get back some votes before yeah. the elections and not uh, MPS in the parliament. So, yeah, do, do you think Mario Draghi will be weakened from this, or he had a very forceful speech where he almost seemed angry at times? Like this was probably Mario Draghi, the politician that we'd never seen before. Yeah, you're right. He's doing his best, uh, and uh, um, unfortunately, he is, is likely that he will be weakened uh, anyway. Uh, because I mean, uh, in the last six months before the elections, all the parties will try to, uh, you know, uh, fight for their own battles and, uh, you know, earn votes. Uh, so that's really a hard job for the one who stays in power. Uh, Francesco, if Italians go to vote tomorrow, will they vote on the economy? So is it all about Russian gas and inflation, or do they have other concerns? Well, uh, I guess they will be voting uh, mostly on social concerns, and we know that the energy crisis is uh, really ha having a huge impact on householders and, and families. So uh, I guess the international uh, stage and uh, business uh, uh, is not really, uh, they're not the first uh, yeah, thoughts. Francesco, thank you so much for joining us. That was Formiche.net, Francesco Becchi's journalist. And we'll have plenty more, of course, from Rome throughout the day. The focus, of course, is on the markets. The markets seem to be taking it into their stride after that Mario Draghi speech. They believe that he will stay. They believe that they will manage. He will manage this period of volatility. Coming up, we'll have plenty more from Rome. We'll look at the markets. We'll talk about inflation. And also, we speak to the Eurogroup president and the Irish finance minister, Pascal Donahoe. Maybe he has a thing or two to say about tax. Taxation, for sure. Neil maybe have a thing or two to say about this new ECB tool. We'll ask him shortly. This is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Rome, where we're covering the political crisis in Italy with Mario Draghi. We think the market certainly believe that he will stay. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg Business Flash in London is Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne.
Hi, Francine. Twitter has scored an early win against Elon Musk in its fight to make him complete his $44 billion buyout. A Delaware judge has agreed to fast-track the case with an October trail date, despite Musk's legal team arguing that Twitter was unfairly pushing for an early trial. Twitter shares jumped as much as 5.4% after that ruling. Now, Netflix shares surged after results showed subscriber losses weren't actually as bad as expected. 970,000 subscribers were lost in the second quarter, about half of what Wall Street expected. The streaming service expects a return to growth and sign up a million subscribers in the current quarter. Now, Volkswagen's most affordable vehicles will share more parts and factories to boost efficiency. That's a message from the new head of VW's main car brand, Thomas Schaefer. In an interview with Bloomberg, Schaefer says Volkswagen's brands have wasted too much time being preoccupied with each other rather than competing with other car makers. Now, Cathy Wood's ARK Investment Management is pulling the plug on an ETF for the first time, closing down ARK Transparency. The ETF gained only $12 million in assets since launching at the end of last year, a fraction of the $9 billion in Woods' flagship fund. The Transparency ETF was a rare passive vehicle from ARK, which is better known for focus focusing on active management and disruptive innovation. And Carrefour is selling a controlling stake in its Taiwanese retail operations to local partner Uni President Enterprises. The deal gives the unit an enterprise value of just over $2 billion and is expected to close in the middle of next year. Carrefour is refocusing on its core regions in Europe and also Latin America. The French retailer set up its first outlet in Taiwan in 19. 89 and that's your Bloomberg business flash Francine Leanne, thank you so much. Leanne Guerin's there. Now, Goldman Sachs President John Waldron says the Fed is making the right moves to combat surging inflation. He spoke, he spoke with Bloomberg about how small businesses are being affected by the current economic conditions. Number one in many of the small businesses with whom I talk to here at the summit is workforce. We understand that small businesses are the engine that drive the economy and drive this nation. And so we are very uh, aware of the challenges in the economy with the fl inflation and the supply, chi the supply chain challenges. We also know that we can make a great impact. And we're able to apply many of the learnings that we've received in the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program to navigate those challenges. And so when we put people to work, we're making an impact in our community. We're making an impact to the tax base. So I am optimistic about what's to come in light of inflation and the supply chain. And from what I'm hearing from my peers here, which is the largest gathering of small businesses to convene in the nation, uh, they're optimistic as well. And in the past two years, they've had tremendous growth in spite of the pandemic, in spite of the lockdowns. And we're looking forward as to what's to come in the next 12 to 18 months. You talked about labor and employment being one of these high issues. Yesterday, you had earnings at Goldman Sachs. And there's this line that everyone's talking about slowing hiring velocity. Are you recalibrating for the next phase? Are you preparing for slower growth? Well, what does that mean? What it means in plain English <laughs> is we're hiring fewer people, but we're still hiring. It's an important distinction. We, we've hired a number of people in the last couple of years as we've executed on our growth plan. We've grown the firm quite considerably. We've built new businesses and new platforms, and we've needed a lot of incremental people to execute upon that plan, and we still do need those people <clears throat> and we're continuing to grow but we are going to grow at a slower pace in light of the economic situation that we see in front of us now and that we forecast could get worse from here so we have to plan and calibrate accordingly but we continue to invest in our human capital we will continue to hire we will continue to grow and what's also coming back is those reviews at the end of the year so potentially planning to get rid of more people that may be weighing down the business I think there might have been some confusion and reaction to what we said. We, we always do performance evaluations at the end of the year. We always like to give our people feedback. That really has nothing to do with whether we're reducing headcount or increasing headcount. It's giving feedback and evaluation to our people, which is the right thing to do as you're developing your human capital. The other thing Jessica mentioned was inflation. And I have to ask you, in January, you were quite critical of the Fed. Potentially, they were behind the curve. You even said at this point we should bring back Paul Volcker. So far, are you satisfied with what the Fed has done? 
I think you're seeing the Fed move quite aggressively, and in my opinion, very appropriately to get on top of what's significant inflation building in the economy, and clearly trying to front load a lot of the moves, policy moves, to try to deal with inflation. And so I, I, we at Goldman Sachs are, are impressed with what they're doing. We expect them to continue to be aggressive in combating inflation, uh, and I'd say so far, so good. Well, that was Goldman Sachs President John Walder and Jessica Johnson Copper speaking to our very own Anne Marie Harder. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, on Europe, on the Italians, and the crisis that we're seeing at the moment. Coming up, the Eurogroup President and the Irish Finance Minister Pascal Donahoe. That interview is next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacquan. I'm here in Rome covering the political crisis. Now, Ireland's inflation rate for June came in red hot at 9.1% year on year, firmly above the euro area average. This, as the European Commission says, it expects the Irish economy to expand this year by 2.6%. Well, we are delighted to be joined by the Irish Finance Minister, but also your group president, Pascal Donoghue. Thank you so much, Minister, for joining us. I have a number of questions on inflation, on how Europe will fare in the next couple of months, and then we need to talk about taxation. But first, should we assume now in our economic projections that we will have a gas embargo from Russia with all of the inflationary pressure that ensures? Well, we have recognized, Francine, for some time within the European Union that this is a risk and that the nature of this risk is likely to become clearer tomorrow. And that is why within the European Union steps have been underway now for many, many months to build up our inventories of energy, particularly of uh, gas. And it is also why today the European Commission will be bringing forward proposals to help us manage these kind of energy pressures later in the year. So it's been recognized as a risk and we will take so, any steps that we can to mitigate the consequences of it. So what kind of steps should we be thinking about at a Eurogroup level as we get into the winter months and people need their heating? Is it right to start thinking of a plan to use less gas now to make sure that we're better prepared for the winter? So many governments within the European Union are already issuing guidance to their citizens regarding energy consumption in the time ahead. And I believe what will happen uh, when the Commission publish proposals and governments also begin to lay out their own plans with regards to this is you'll see two uh, areas receive particular focus. The first one is, is how we can better manage consumption within economies, particularly if there is going to be pressure in supply. And then secondly, what we can do uh, to build up inventory if we do face a challenge of mm -hmm. reduced supply for a period of time. Of course, all of this will be happening in the context of the European Union looking at what we can do to accelerate our movement to dependency on renewable energies. Uh, but that is going to take time. And in the time that is ahead, it will be about how we can manage supply in a way that mitigates the economic risk. Yeah. Are, are we expecting too much of central banks? Tomorrow there's the ECB decision, of course, on interest rates. Markets pricing in a 50% chance that there's a 50 basis point hike. Are we expecting too much of central banks in dealing with inflation? Well, what you're seeing happening within the European Union and indeed elsewhere is central banks act to deal with inflationary pressures that are broader. Uh, what we recognize is that if higher levels of inflation become embedded within the European economy, not only does it pose such a challenge to living standards today and to income and to jobs today, it also poses a real risk to the ability of the economy of the euro area and the euro area to grow in the time ahead. So the ECB will take the steps that it believes are necessary to deal with such an inflationary risk. And they've already indicated in recent meetings they're thinking with regard to this. Yeah. Uh, Minister, I know there's also reports that you're preparing or that the Irish government is preparing on a, on, you know, to put a levy on the windfall tax on energy companies. When will you actually make a decision on this? 
Well, this is only something that uh, every other government in Europe is giving some analysis and consideration to. Uh, but I'm equally aware mm -hmm. of the difficulties and challenges in doing this. If you look at where we are within Ireland, uh, much of our energy supply comes through uh, semi-state organisations that have played a really important role in the development of our energy needs uh, over many decades. Uh, if there is a need uh, to raise more funds from those organisations, it can be done through changes in dividend policy as opposed to changes in taxation policy. And I'm very much aware of the need to get the balance right between having stable and appropriate taxation on the energy sector while also yeah. recognising the fact that they need to invest and we need their investment in moving to alternative and more secure sources of energy in the years mm -hmm. ahead. So at the moment, all this has been done is given consideration, as other governments are doing, and I'm very much aware also of the risks and consequences that need to be managed yeah. in any sudden or arbitrary changes in taxation on the energy sector. Um, Mr. I also want to ask you about the OECD tax deal because we understand that there's a chance now that actually it wouldn't get passed through Congress, which is something that Secretary Yellen had assured it would. Does that change your thoughts on the OECD tax deal? So the OECD process is unfolding exactly as I expected it would. Uh, this is a uh, huge global yeah. endeavour. And as we move towards agreement, from agreement towards implementation, there are always going to be uh, political developments. There will always be moments in which parliaments and governments uh, consider where they are and where the next step forward is. I still expect, as we move through this year and as we move into 2023, that we will see the second pillar of that OECD agreement in regard to a minimum mm -hmm. effective tax rate for that pillar to be uh, delivered. Uh, I'm not going to uh, comment on what may or may not happen within American politics. Yep. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to do so. Uh, but overall, I still believe yep. we'll make progress on it within the European Union. And I believe globally, later on in the year, we will see progress on that rate. I'd make the point very briefly, uh, Francine, that if we do end up in a position where no progress is made uh, on the rate, it will pose a challenge to the overall yep. OECD agreement and open up new risks, new challenges, Ministry. and the risks of unilateral action. And I believe it's in our interest to avoid that, which is why we should work hard to implement the OECD agreement. Minister, thank you so much. Next time you're in London, I'll be sure to be there as well. The Eurogroup President, Irish Finance Minister Pascal Donoghue. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We'll bring you all the latest market news from New York and London. all seem to have our hand on the bunker door. A key message is patience. I think the Fed has a really hard time. I agree that sentiment is quite low. What really is the issue going forward now is how much is the economy going to slow? How much is nominal GDP going to slow? And what does that mean for earnings? This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong, our top stories today. Netflix predicts it will return to growth after losing another million customers. Tesla is the next big tech company to report. The electric car maker will reveal just how much that China lockdown has hurt. Italy's Mario Draghi says his governing coalition can be rebuilt. We are live in Rome for the latest. And that Russian pipeline will resume sending gas to Europe. But first, Vladimir Putin has some conditions. Meanwhile, the EU wants members to cut back on their gas use just in case Russia cuts off supplies. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lyons over in New York. And Kayleigh, a lot of reasons to feel a little bit cautious here in Europe. Yes, stocks are higher, but not necessarily with a great deal of conviction. US futures also a little bit higher, but not much. Well, you definitely saw more conviction in the Asian session 
overnight. Anna, following on from the big gains we saw here in the U.S. yesterday and the optimism on tech in particular after Netflix beat expectations after the bell. So all of that collectively lifting Asia stocks high really across the board. Some of the outperformance coming from Japan with the Nikkei up about 2.7 percent and Chinese tech stocks getting a nice lift as well. The Hang Seng Tech Index was up about one and a half percent. Now, of course, in China, there are ongoing concerns around the COVID zero policy as well as the turmoil in the property sector with now suppliers halting payments to some of those developers given uh, the fact that the developers aren't necessarily paying the suppliers for the materials as a lot of those projects are stalled. Plus, you didn't have any easing of policy overnight. Those loan prime rates remaining unchanged. So all of that together is weighing a little bit on the Chinese yuan today. It is weaker against the dollar by about two tenths of one percent, trading in and around 675. And finally, I would just note in the Chinese bond market that yield on the 10 you're coming in about two basis points at 277 or so. That is the lowest level going back to May, Matt. All right, interesting stuff. We had a ton of conviction in yesterday's session. The cash trade is up almost 3% on the S&P and everything was green. So it's not surprising to see um, a little bit less of a move to the upside on futures today. Nonetheless, the arrow is still green and investors are uh, actually buying a little bit of 10 year debt right now, pushing the yield back down to below uh, 298. Normally, when you see buying in treasuries, you might think that's a safe haven play. So you'd expect maybe a little bit less enthusiasm for risk assets. But when you see the yield go below 3%, especially or anywhere around these levels, it puts a little bit of upward pressure um, on uh, risk assets on S&P futures and then the cash trade at 9:30. NYMEX crude coming down, which also support is supportive of um, a further rally in stocks. So it is still at a relatively high level, 103.40. But at least we're coming off, and I've got a fantastic chart to show, chart to show you about um, correlations later with energy down, um, stocks up. Uh, we're going to talk about natural gas because I think that's the, really the big story of the day is that Nord Stream pipeline, and then Bitcoin right now up about one tenth of one percent, but back up over 20. $23,000, $23,351 after that fantastic Bloomberg Crypto Summit that we had uh, here in New York yesterday, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to hearing more about that summit shortly here on the European equity markets then in positive territory. But as we were saying, not a great deal of conviction, just like in, in the United States, buying equities, but also buying bonds, something of a staging post today, perhaps as we head towards uh, the big news of tomorrow with the ECB. We've got a lot going on today, though, in Italian politics and that natural gas story that Matt referenced. So this is the picture on European stocks right now. But let's roll on and show you some other assets and how they are performing. And we'll start with Italy. We have Italian two year yields uh, on the move, as you can see. So even if the bond markets have been getting themselves pretty nervous about whether Prime Minister Mario Draghi was going to resign, it does seem as if uh, we've got some continuity there. He does say his governing coalition can be rebuilt. We'll get an update from Francine Lacroix in Rome in just a moment. But that has taken the edge off Mario Draghi here to, to calm the spreads, it would seem. And those spreads are tightening. Yields are coming down in Italy. I've got the uh, benchmark natural gas price in the chart for you as well, because as Matt was saying, really big developments there. Yesterday, we were getting a lot of reports that suggested lots of sources were saying uh, you know, the tap taps are going to be turned on on Thursday. We just don't know to what extent. This is the flow of gas from Gazprom in Russia into Europe. And now we've got the endorsement of President Putin, but he does say there are conditions attached. We wait to see if that key equipment is, is installed that's coming through from Canada and what level of flow that then results in. And, of course, where the politics takes us on that as well. Sticking with the gas story, Uniper is trading up by just shy of 14% in the German session. This a big gas player over in Germany. They're seeking a bailout from the German government. Are we getting a little bit closer. That seems to be the latest narrative and that pushes the stock up. ASML, this Sakali is a company we've talked about before, huge giant of the suppliers uh, to the tech sector, suppliers to the chip makers. They make those uh, vast lithography machines. They're under pressure on the, the geopolitical front and indeed hiring, it seems, could be an issue for them in the future. Right now, they have issues with accounting and when they can re record their revenue, they had to cut in half their revenue growth expectations for the full year and the stock has been weaker today. Okay, Anna, well, we're watching that stock today, but there's plenty of else, other stories we're watching in the day ahead, including politics in the UK. Conservative MPs will decide which two candidates will face off in the battle to replace Boris Johnson as UK Prime Minister. The result of the fifth and final ballot of Tory MPs will be announced at 11 a.m. New York time. Plus, speaking of Italian politics, which Anna was mentioning, Prime Minister Mario Draghi will face a confidence vote at 1 p.m. New York time. Of course, that follows his remarks earlier, saying his coalition can be rebuilt. And finally, more tech earnings coming after the bell. Tesla 
We'll be reporting, reporting post market today, Matt. All right, we're going to get caught up on all of those numbers as well, but let's get back to the political story. Italy's Prime Minister Mario Draghi told the Italian Senate that his fractious coalition can be rebuilt. This tampers down concerns that he'll quit the government soon. And the only path, if you want to stay together, is to build this pact right from the beginning with courage, with altruism, with credibility. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix joins us now from Rome. And Francine, when it comes to political volatility in the West, nothing can top Italy. They're showing it again. You are absolutely right, Matt. But you know what really surprised me? And you can't really hear it because of the translator there. This was a fired up Mario Draghi. I mean, I've been following him at the ECB and as Prime Minister of Italy. I mean, this was an angry, this was an, you know, political animal almost, Mario Draghi. It's like the first time you hear your dad swear. And he's put certain conditions on him staying. Now, it's quite unclear. The market believes he'll stay because he has the arithmetics in Parliament to go through. But frankly, it's quite unclear how uh, the various factions will position themselves. So there's a vote a little bit later. They have four hours to discuss it. And again, at risk, if he stays, fine. The market continues on its way. If he doesn't, and we go to snap elections, this means that actually the distribution or the funds from the EU could be in jeopardy. And it could also change the way that the ECB sees this fragmentation tool, because what they don't want to do is give Italy a free pass if there's political turmoil. Francine, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix reporting from Rome. Italy's political drama uh, comes amid an economic and energy crisis in Europe. Russian President Vladimir Putin has signaled that Europe will start getting gas again through a key pipeline, but warned flows may be tightly curbed. The EU is set to propose a voluntary 15% cut in natural gas use by member states starting next month on concern Russia may halt supplies. And of course, even if they restart on Thursday, at what levels and for how long will be a question. Question we will ask often, no doubt, here in Europe. Now, let's turn our attention to big tech, though. After losing more than a million customers in the first half of 2022, Netflix has a message for investors. It could have been worse. Seems to be that message. The company lost 970,000 subscribers in the second quarter, less than half what Wall Street feared, thanks in large part to a new season of Stranger Things, the service's most popular English language series. Bloomberg's Alex Webb joins us now with more details. It's not all about Korean uh, dramas this time around. It's about Stranger Things and Stranger Things happening in subscriber numbers over at Netflix, Alex. Yeah, when we were talking about Netflix yesterday in anticipation of the numbers, we were saying that any surprise to the upside would be positively reflected in the stock and ultimately that's what we saw. The market had been expecting a, a loss of 2 million subscribers. Ultimately, it was closer to, to 1 million and so we've seen the stock, I think, up 7% last time I saw in pre-market trading. So, that is clearly the good news. Looking forward, they're still expecting, the market had been expecting 1.8 million subscribers in this quarter. It's not looking like it's going to be that sort of number, but that does perhaps leave some room to surprise. Okay, Alex, well, there's a lot of tech stories to keep on top of this morning. Another one being that Twitter has scored an early win against Elon Musk in that fight to make him complete that $44 billion buyout. A Delaware judge agreed to fast track the case with an October trial date, despite Musk's legal team arguing that Twitter was unfairly pushing for an early trial. Meanwhile, over on Elon Musk's other area of focus, Tesla is going to be reporting earnings after the close today. Alex, what can we expect from that? So there's a lot of expectation on the supply side. They will have had quite a few issues. The uh, factory in Shanghai had to close down because of the lockdowns there for quite an extended spell. They're also spending a lot to expand production in Berlin and Texas. The thing that I find particularly interesting is whether they can show that demand remains high. But there's a number that's quite interesting, which is the revenue per employee that they have. And you look at this chart, you can see that white line there is Tesla. And it, even though it's quite a young company, and you think, you'd think therefore a bit more efficient, it doesn't make as much money per employee as its established rivals like GM, Toyota, and Ford. And so it's cutting jobs at the moment. If those efficiencies have started to kick in, that will be good news for the market and show that it's starting to act more like a grown-up car company. Alex, thanks so much. Alex Webb there talking to us about what we can expect from Tesla later on. Now, it's fashionable in the crypto winter wreckage to talk about failures in risk management and regulatory gaps, both of which were among the themes of the Bloomberg Crypto Summit yesterday. Take a listen to some of the highlights from our conversations with industry leaders. Luna was the first kind of 
part of this crisis and it started a daisy chain of events. Some of this is, is her behavior. Some of this is not a crypto specific phenomenon. Some of this is like what investing looked like at sort of peak mania. The fundamentals of Bitcoin and any viable investment thesis uh, hasn't changed. I think the worst happened and now we're rebuilding. Sometimes volatile days can be good for profit, but in the long run view, like we like it when markets are healthy and efficient and going up and stable. My heart doctor lost a million dollars uh, in Celsius, all his Bitcoin, uh, and was really upset. Now I'm thinking about him, I have to worry about his heart instead of him worrying about my heart. How healthy the ecosystem is in the long run is gonna be a very strong predictor of you know how much we can grow. People aren't gonna give up on crypto. What we really want is an open, true, fair marketplace. Web3 and crypto is perhaps the answer that they seek to have both a capitalist system that can also be equitable. Bloomberg Chanali Vasek was part of our summit coverage and joins us now for more. So we heard a lot, Chanali, of people saying, you know, oh, it's been bad and we should have been paying more attention. Regulators maybe should have been involved. Um, but the bottom line is a lot of people lost a lot of money, including Michael Novogratz's heart doctor. And his wrestling coach. Oh. And so it's interesting. A lot of things are going to have to change. So much soul searching. And remember, some of the soul searching is a good thing in the sense that you are seeing Bitcoin hitting another low, rising another almost 7% over 24 hours. And what's going to change exactly? From Mike Novogratz's perspective, you know, you hear that story about his heart doctor and his wrestling coach. And the whole idea here is that consumer protections need to change. And he was saying that if the industry doesn't self-regulate, the SEC is going to be doing it for them. The other thing about this is investor behavior. You know, when you think about how Elon Musk waived due diligence on that Twitter deal and everyone thought that was bold, <laughs> Apparently, this is happening all the time when it comes to cryptocurrency investments. So the talk of the town yesterday was really a lot about how venture capitalists have to ask for information, again, about the cryptocurrency companies and ventures that they invest in, which is, you know, normal course of business and other ways of investing. Yeah, and my other takeaway from the summit was all of these people in this space, while recognizing the volatility in the short term, are still incredibly bullish on at least this technology over the long term. Bloomberg, Shanali Basik, thank you so much and great coverage at the summit yesterday. And of course, billionaire Sam Bankman Fried of FTX is the subject of today's big take as well. You can read it about, read all about it online at Bloomberg.com or typing an I big take into your terminal. Let's head over to Washington now. The Senate has voted to begin debate on legislation to provide more than $52 billion to the American semiconductor industry. It's a major milestone for the long stalled bill. Meanwhile, lawmakers have failed to make progress on tackling climate change after a key senator blocked legislation. That would be one Joe Manchin from West Virginia. So President Biden is set to announce executive action to confront climate change today. Anne-Marie Horder and Bloomberg Washington correspondent joins us now from D.C. with more on what we can and expect. Anne-Marie, what exactly will these executive orders look like? Well, the president's going to outline his plan today on some of these executive orders, likely some money going to some administration uh, units under FEMA, potentially for the wind farm industry, and then he's going to talk about more actions he will take. But we should note, something the administration is weighing right now, but do not plan to come out with today, is creating this emergency declaration. That would give them wide scope to really tackle climate change in terms of propelling clean energy construction and even stopping fossil fuel issues uh, use. The issue the administration has and the White House is weighing is this is really comes down to the delicate dance of politics. If they were to go ahead with that, it potentially could annihilate Senator Joe Manchin, who last week, of course, blocked these climate change provisions and tax hikes. At the same time, they still need him in this 50-50 Senate, especially as they're still debating things like health care provisions and legislation. So it's politically tricky for them. But today, the president wants to make clear that he thinks climate change is an existential threat, and you can expect more executive orders from the president. All right. Well, I believe he'll be speaking at 2.45 p.m. Eastern today. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Horder in Washington, thank you so much. Now let's get back to the markets and take a look at some stocks moving in free market trading in the U.S. Alex Webb was just running us through the Netflix story, obviously a big beat and a big move for the stock as a result, but that is translating to other streaming-oriented companies, the likes of Roku and Disney, up 3.3 and 2.3 percent, respectively. Another big mover, and this comes back to the crypto conversation once again, is Applied Blockchain. This is a stock that 
literally doubled yesterday up 100%, although it went from just over $1 to just over $2, so we have to keep that in mind. But the rally continuing today up about 13 percentage points. Part of that due to the broader lift we are seeing in the crypto space. The other part having to do with a five-year deal it inked with Marathon Digital. Finally, one stock moving to the downside, Interactive Brokers. It reported earnings that missed expectations. Its daily trading revenue was down about 6% on a year-on-year -year basis, so that stock is down about 3.5% before the bell, Anna. Kaylee, coming up on the program, we will deep dive into the Eurozone economy, especially the German economy and the risks posed to it right now. Holger Schmieding joins us, Berenberg's chief economist. He'll give us his views on the flow of gas and how important that will be. And Lorenzo Codogno, founder and chief economist at LC Macro Advisors and crucially former chief economist at the Italian Treasury. He will join us to give us his thoughts on what is currently going on in Italian politics and where today's developments lead us, uh, leave us. And tune in tonight at 9.30 p.m. Wall Street for the full airing of The Next Big Risk on Bloomberg TV. Abby jo uh, Joseph Cohen, Sam Bankman-Fried and Ken Molas share their views on the end of globalization, the pandemic and the fading American dream. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to uh, Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons here in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. Also in London, Dan Curtis, our uh, star producer, Olympic level rowing champion, put together this um, chart <laughs> for me, which shows a big negative correlation between the prices of natural gas and risk assets or European stocks in this case. That makes a lot of sense because every time Putin puts on the pressure, it seems to worry markets. And when we get evidence that he may let the gas flow, we feel much better. Tassos Vassos, a Bloomberg credit market reporter, joins us now to talk about the impact of gas flows on credit. Tassos, we're seeing this across all asset classes. Um, that is true. And now we're at the, um, at the stage where we're actually feeling much better uh, by what's happening. Uh, we have indications that Russian gas is going to start flowing again even though it's going to be curbed and come with certain conditions. But the market is loving it at this stage. Um, the um, a, a gauge of, um, <coughs> of credit conditions in Europe has uh, become much better in the past two days, and that's because of the, of the gas situation. There were some concerns that we are going to have, uh, we're going to enter an energy crisis in Europe uh, in, the, in the autumn months, specifically because we're not going to have the flow coming out of Russia. This seems to be alleviating at this stage, and the market is taking it very, very well. Mm, Tassos, good morning. Uh, another body, if you like, that's watching this very closely will be the ECB, because even if the two aren't directly linked, they, you know, they won't want any of this distraction to be going on at a time when they've already got a lot to juggle, from Italian politics to, this, to the sky-high inflation rates across the Eurozone. The market seems to be kind of 50-50 as to whether we're going to get a 50 basis point hike tomorrow. What's your latest thinking? Uh, well, actually, at this stage, we're getting closer to the 50 basis points, at least when it comes to the market um, pricing that in, um, because 25 basis points at this stage seems to be very insufficient to, do with the, to deal with the sort of inflation that we're looking at the, uh, the euro area at this stage. The ECB is well behind other central banks in that. They haven't raised interest rates in uh, more than a decade now, so they have to, 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 keep, to keep up with the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England. Uh, expectations are building that at least if they're not going to do it um, tomorrow, even though the people believe they're going to do 50 basis points tomorrow, they're definitely going to move fast in, in the autumn as well. So there's no way to avoid that anyway. Yeah. We're so far through the global central bank's narrative about fighting inflation, yet the ECB has not started yet. Worth remembering as we head towards tomorrow. Tassos, thanks so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Tassos Fossos uh, with us in studio here in London. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go. That is the function to use on your terminal to find the market's live blog. This is Bloomberg. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger is warning President Biden of endless confrontation with China. The man who helped reestablish U.S. ties with China in the 70s spoke in an interview with Bloomberg News Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite. Kissinger said that geopolitics today requires, quote, Nixonian flexibility to help defuse conflicts between the U.S. and China.
In the UK, Conservative MPs will decide today which two candidates will face off in the battle to replace Prime Minister Boris Johnson. On Monday, former Chancellor of the Exchequer Rishi Sunak topped the fourth ballot of Tory lawmakers. He was just two votes short of the threshold that would guarantee him a spot. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss is now the favorite to join Sunak. Coming up, we may talk the UK economy as well as the ECB and the Fed. Holger Schmieding of Berenberg joins us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Netflix predicts it will return to growth after losing another million customers. It also plans to introduce a lower-priced version of the service with advertising. Tesla is the next big tech company to report. The electric car maker will reveal just how much that China lockdown has hurt. Italy's Mario Draghi says his governing coalition can be rebuilt. That's tamping down concerns that he'll quit the government and throw the country into chaos. We will speak with the former chief economist at the Italian Treasury. And that Russian pipeline will resume sending gas to Europe. But first, Vladimir Putin has some conditions. Meanwhile, the EU wants members to cut back on their gas use just in case Russia cuts off supplies. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lyons in New York. And Matt, it feels a bit of a transition day. We've, we've come a long way on that narrative that maybe we'd uh, we'd expected too much hiking from the Federal Reserve. We dialed back those expectations on Friday and the assets sort of uh, ran with that theme for a little while. Then a sprinkling of corporate earnings, of course, uh, on top. Yeah, the corporate earnings, I think, key here. You know, Bloomberg Economics thinks the terminal rate will be 5% now. So still expectations for a lot of Fed hikes. Nonetheless, we had a huge rally in the cash trade yesterday. I think two and three quarters percent was the gain on the S&P 500, and it was incredibly broad. Everybody uh, was up. We still see gains in futures, although they're minimal, right? Only one, two-tenths of one percent. And investors are buying 10-year debt. That's keeping the yield, though, down below 3% percent supportive of equities. NYMEX crude is also coming down a little over a dollar a barrel supportive of equities, um, although at a relatively high level, 103.13. And Bitcoin is rising from midnight and back up above the $23,000 level. So you see it right now at more than $23,500. Kaylee, what do you see in terms of uh the pre-market movers this morning. Well, you're actually seeing some movers related to a headline that just crossed the Bloomberg terminal that Macau will reopen casinos on July 23rd if conditions allow. So that's only three days away. So the likes of Wynn Resorts and Las Vegas Sands, both of which have big operations in Macau, are getting a bit of a boost off of that news. Now, of course, the other movers we are paying attention to relate to one story in particular. That would be Netflix, which reported after the bell yesterday. Those subscriber losses, not as bad as Wall Street had feared. Less than a million losses rather than the two million. That the street was expecting. So that stock after falling by about two thirds on the year to date basis so far before they reported its results is now getting a nice lift up about 7% and it's lifting other streaming companies as well. Roku and Disney each up in the ballpark of two to 3% this morning. And of course, the earnings we wait after the bell today, Tesla. Anna will be very closely watching the situation in China, how it has hampered production, what the outlook for the second half looks like. But ahead of those results, Tesla is up about two percentage points before the bell. Lots of focus on tech earnings then this week coming out of the United States. Here in Europe, uh, we're focused on a lot of geopolitics. We're focused on the flow of gas, focused on Italian politics, of course. Stocks dealing with that pretty well this morning, up by a quarter of 1% now on the Stocks Europe 600. We started the day in positive territory, kind of wobbled in the early part of the morning, but now uh, back uh, in our stride and making some modest gains. The Italian two-year yield, I've put that in because of our focus on the Italian political story. We still have that confidence vote to come in Rome. It seems, though, Mario Draghi comforting the markets, issuing those words that bring down spreads, that reduce that spread between Italian BCP yields and German Bunds uh, by saying that he thinks his coalition can be rebuilt. And that was a crucial question hanging over him uh, and his uh, statements today. We've got the natural gas price on the rise once again, up by 4%. It dropped yesterday on a lot of reports from, from us at Bloomberg and from elsewhere that suggested that Russia is minded to turn back on those taps on Thursday. That's tomorrow, of course. But for how long do those taps remain open? What conditions will President Putin apply to the reopening of that supply through the Nord Stream pipeline? A lot of questions still remain. And Uniper, we put this in. This is a gas giant, of course, up by 17% in the German session. It's been in discussions for a number of weeks now about the potential for a bailout or a, 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 a rescue by the German government. How much of the company will the German government end up owning? Well, all of this talk seems to be coming to a head, and that stock up another 17% in today's session. Now, let me tell you that tonight at 9.30 p.m. Wall Street time, you can watch the full airing of the next big risk on Bloomberg Television. Abby Joseph-Cohen, Sam Bankman-Fried, 
Reid and Ken Molas share their views on what threats investors should be looking out for five to ten years down the road. Here's what Ken Molas had to say about the end of globalisation and Germany in particular. Germany's strategy up to this point was to outsource their military to the United States, to outsource their financial management to the EU. They outsourced their energy supply to Russia, uh, and they outsourced their end market to China. Uh, this was the complete globalization of an economy, and you can see at this point, I think they're in extreme trouble. The views there of Ken Molis. Holger Schmieding joins us, Berenberg Chief Economist, to talk about the Eurozone economy, the global story, but also let's start, Holger, on the German economy. We just heard Ken Molis there talking about the, the geostrategic choices, I suppose, that Germany has made over decades, and maybe that leaves the German economy in a particularly tough place right now. What are the prospects for Germany, do you think, from here? Well, Germany is indeed in a tough situation now. It remains dependent on Russian gas, and the Russian gas supply is not secure. And as a result of the very high prices that we already have and the hit to consumers, Germany is probably now in recession. Having said that, I would not be all that negative on the long-run outlook for the German economy, because Germany is so globalized. It actually means that the German economy has learned to adapt to challenges. There have always been challenges coming from major exchange rate movements, coming from major crises. And because German companies, especially in industry, are so heavily exposed to competition, they just know how to deal with challenges. So never underestimate the ability of Germany, of its companies, to adjust to challenges, even if the challenges are huge at the moment. Holger, what do you expect to see in terms of rationing in Germany? I mean, are factory workers going to be, are factories going to be cut down to four days a week? We have no idea of that. At the moment, it is still a bit more likely than not that there will not have to be a rationing of gas. At the moment, we are still sort of on track. If some gas from Russia comes in the next few months, to fill our storage facilities up to the desired 90% before the onset of the cold season. So the discussion about rationing is a serious risk, a risk that would probably turn a somewhat mild recession into a serious recession over the winter, but it's not yet the base case. Well, we already see some rationing unrelated uh, to the natural gas issues in, in London with the announcement that Heathrow is going to cap flights there. The EU, Holger, says... Um, the worst case scenario if gas is cut off is a one and a half percent contraction in GDP. Does that seem a little too optimistic to you? Well, my guess is that on top of the recession, which we already predict, which is a decline in Eurozone GDP by about 1% next year, we would have another hit to the Eurozone of around one, probably 1.5 percentage points if there had to be serious rationing of gas. That is, if parts of industry had to be cut off from gas. We don't quite know the precise plans they are being worked on, but that gives you a rough magnitude of the potential hit to the economy from gas rationing, which is a serious risk, but not yet really the base case. Okay, well, Holger, as we're talking about risks to the European economy and the recession you're describing, at the same time, the market is also pricing in essentially 50-50 odds that the move tomorrow from the ECB is 50 basis points. How much is the ECB going to realistically be able to do if they're hiking into weakness? <sighs> The ECB really is in a weird situation. They are now hiking rates into what probably is, well, we are on the brink of recession. And once the summer tourist season, where people are spending money, once that is over, the Eurozone will probably be in recession, say, by September or October at the latest. And into that, the ECB wants to hike rates in a situation where the inflationary pressure is almost exclusively coming from abroad rather than from domestic excess demand and not yet from domestic excess wage hikes. So the ECB is in a funny situation. I do think that tomorrow they probably will deliver 25 rather than 50. Why? There is a case for 50, given that inflation is high. Yeah. But ECB yeah. President Christine Lagarde has been so explicit in her Sintra speech that it will be 25 basis point. And it would really look odd if the council were not to follow that.
Fair point. And of course, Holger, it's not just the rate decision we're looking out for tomorrow. We're also hoping to gain an understanding of what exactly this transmission protection mechanism is going to look like. In your mind, is the ECB realistically going to be able to keep control of the periphery of Italy specifically when the political risks there are still unclear? In the big picture, the European Central Bank can keep control of the situation. Why? Because in dire straits, it could print a lot of money to intervene in bond markets, and bond markets know that. The ECB is the lender of last resort. The real question is, at what point, under which conditions, this support would kick in? If in the current situation, with political uncertainty, for instance, in Italy, it would make little sense for the ECB to intervene unless things were, say, in bond markets really go completely, completely, completely wild. This is now not something where you could say, um, we have this situation in Italy, which is just weird, which is just markets going wrong. At the moment, we have genuine political uncertainty in Italy. And in my view, the ECB should not act against that. They should ideally tomorrow tell us they have an anti-fragmentation tool, they have rough ideas how it would work, but they're not going to tell us the details and they will certainly not intervene sort of in a political rather than economic funny situation. Okay, no doubt they are very focused on the goings on in Rome today then, Holger. Thank you so much for joining us. Holger Schmieding joining us there of Berenberg. We will stick with this theme. Coming up, Lorenzo Codogno, founder and chief economist at LC Macro Advisors, will be with us. Crucially, he is a former chief economist at the Italian Treasury. What are his views on what's at stake in Italy and the broader ECB picture? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, former U.S. Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta. That's at 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lyons with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. In Italy, Prime Minister Mario Draghi has told the Senate that his coalition can be rebuilt. That's easing concerns that Draghi will quit the government and throw the country into chaos. Markets rallying after his comments, but of course that follows a sell-off we have seen over the last week when Draghi said he wanted to resign because he didn't have the backing of all of the parties in his coalition. Joining us now for more on the political situation in Italy is Lorenzo Codogno, founder and chief economist at LC Macro Advisors and former chief economist and director general at the Italian Treasury. Lorenzo, thanks for being here. So Draghi thinks his coalition can be rebuilt, but if it remains fractious and hard to keep together, is that really the optimal outcome for the Italian economy? No, it would not be a good outcome, but uh, he made it clear that he wants to uh, rebuild the coalition and want to relaunch the national unity government, but there must be unity. So if there is no unity, probably he would step down. Now, in his speech, which lasted about 30 minutes, he listed all the things that needs to be done between now and the next election, so the spring of next year. And he also explicitly mentioned some of the touchy points for the Five Star Movement and the League. So it remains unclear, in my view, whether these two parties will confirm the support or will decide to walk away. OK, so we get that vote a little bit later on, Lorenzo. We'll look for the outcome there. Give us a sense of, when it comes down to it, what are the things that are dividing Italian politics at the moment? I understand how to spend a lot of the money that's coming through from the European, uh, the European pot is part of, part of the conversation. Support to hard-pressed households, support to Ukrainian fighters. What's the real sticking point? I think there are a number of uh, very specific issues which are part of the, uh, say, ID of the, uh, the, of the, of the several uh, parties forming uh, the coalition at the moment. Uh, but I would say there is a more general political uh, issue, which is elections are approaching. And as elections are approaching, inevitably, uh, some political parties uh, would want to uh, separate uh, uh, the message of the party from the message of the 
a national unity government to differentiate and trying to gain consensus. And this is inevitable. So I think today Draghi said to everybody, listen, I mean, I'm here, I'm available, but if you want to continue this experience until the end of the political term, there must be unity. And uh, to me, ha as we speak uh, today, uh, this unity is still not uh, fully uh, in place. Yeah. So we will see the reaction of parties, uh, but the risk is clearly that uh, uh, the unity is not in place uh, and Draghi is forced yeah. to resign. That's the risk, Lorenzo. Is there also an opportunity from Mario Draghi's perspective to come out of this stronger? Can his position at all be reinforced by this confidence vote? I think, uh, I think he has no political ambition, and so he is really uh, trying to serve his country in the best possible way. Um, I, I think uh, uh, the, if Italy goes to elections, it would not be a disaster, uh, but it would cause some delays and some disruptions, uh, which, uh, given the situation and the delicate uh, economic outlook, uh, probably would not be ideal in this situation. I wonder what you think, Lorenzo, about the ECB's tool can it be unlimited? Uh, do they run the risk of a uh, court challenge? You know, the ECB is continuing to introduce new tools and new uh, procedures here, but uh, the real problem is that uh, uh, the Eurozone needs to proceed very quickly towards uh, uh, economic uh, uh, and uh, political integration, because if that is missing, uh, these can only be fixings, temporary fixings. Now, uh, uh, these temporary fixings can actually prevent the widening of spreads uh, uh, on conditions, but uh, I think uh, uh, it remains unclear whether the tool that will be announced tomorrow will be really effective because it is challenging and also whether it will be communicated in an effective way by the ECB and Madame Lagarde. So I think uh, there is still uncertainty whether this will prove to be a, a sufficiently uh, effective tool to prevent the fragmentation and prevent uh, uh, instability, financial instability in the Eurozone. Mm. Is it possible for them to craft something that is unlimited to satisfy the markets, but also limited to satisfy the courts? A difficult one to ponder. Lorenzo, thank you very much for joining us. Lorenzo Cononio of LC Macro Advisors, formerly at the Italian Treasury. Coming up on the program, back to the earnings story, back to the tech story, and Tesla out with results later today. We will preview what to expect next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna, uh, Anna Edwards. Kaylee Lines was here also, and she'll be joining Tom Keen next on Bloomberg Surveillance. He joins us right now to give us his best chart of the day. Tom, what have you got? Uh, what I got is what I had the other day. I show the bank chart, and so it's earnings season. Let's look at the tech chart as well. And of course, it's a story of growthiness. This is an extraordinary chart, normalized in log normalized where slope matters. This is the logarithm of the percent change of Apple, Microsoft, Google, and in yellow, the Standard & Poor's 500. And it's just an absolutely remarkable chart. You can look at some of the parallel lines. You can look at when uh, the CEO changed at Microsoft and get a, a, a view here. But what it's really about is growth of revenue, growth of free cash flow, and then each of these companies has a different approach on how they return cash to shareholders. Mm. And, Tom, one of the things that, st that stood out so far when we've been looking more broadly at the earnings story has been the effect of FX on earnings. Certainly yeah. this was the story with IBM and uh, with Johnson & Johnson yesterday. And I know that you've got an FX voice on the program today. Well, we're going to do that. And Elsa Lingo starts drawing in that she's so so you, so comfortable with ECB and we go to the ECB uh, tomorrow. But what I would say, uh, Anna, is was with FX and with adjustment in corporations, it's back to my ute. You know, pretty soon we're going to start talking LIFO, FIFO, and the rest of it. And it's a return here <laughs> to the, inf you know, we're in the new inflation, 9.4% uh, in England. So, you know, we're back to phrases we haven't used in a while.
Yeah, back to some of those uh, accounting terms we have known and loved. Tom Keane, thank you very much. Tom sure. Keane back at the top of the hour with this stellar lineup of guests, uh, including Elsa Linos and uh, many others. Let's turn to one of those corporate reports that we will be uh, digesting in detail later on today. That is Tesla. Uh, Tesla's run of rising sales and profit is under pressure as the electric vehicle maker prepares to report second quarter results after the close today. Craig Trudell, Bloomberg Global Car Czar. I've always wanted to be a czar. Don't know how you get one of those titles, but Craig's done it. Mm. Joins us uh, on set here in London uh, today. Uh, cars are that you are, Craig. Talk to us about the difficulties that this business has been having in China with lockdowns. Yeah, obviously the, the, the Shanghai shutdown was uh, a huge factor in the second quarter. We've already seen the production and delivery numbers from Tesla, and we've seen that they, they did take a significant hit uh, from the weeks that that plant was not able to operate. Uh, it's a hugely important factory for them in that it's not only feeding the, the local market, but been a huge uh, export contributor the last uh, a couple of years. Uh, and so that affects their business here in, in Europe. So uh, the big question and, and sort of, you know, what uh, this report hinges on for me is, you know, just how much confidence Musk can project about, you know, the forward looking yeah. outlook for production and can he get uh, the production back up and running uh, in order to, to meet the demand that's out there. Anna, you know, you, you get that title with an incredible amount of experience and skill. Craig Trudell has <laughs> run our transport team uh, in the U.S. and North America. He's run the transport team in Europe. He's run the transport team in Asia. So he's been stationed around the world. Um, most of that time, Craig, uh, Tesla was the undisputed world champion of electric car production. Does that change next year? Does that change this year? You, you hear a lot of companies starting to talk about their belief that they can uh, supplant uh, Tesla, but uh, so far we've heard a lot of talk and, and uh, not any signs of that you know, necessarily uh, happening anytime soon in terms of a, a, a changeover in leadership. Uh, I, I think you know, the, the you know, maybe sort of uh, company that, that you most uh, expect to uh, you know, really give uh, Musk a run for his money in the next couple of years is probably Volkswagen. Uh, there's been a lot of buzz about uh, BYD in, in yeah. China, mm. uh, but of course you have to kind of factor in plug in hybrids, which is, you know, uh, depending on your view, you know, much different in terms of how you rank these companies, well, this is... uh, but, but certainly they're challenging for it as well. I mean, you mentioned Volkswagen, it's worth 86 billion euros. Tesla's worth $763 billion. Is this just like the last meme stock that needs the air to come out? I, I think it, it, it does sort of beg the question, as much as they do have this, you know, leadership position, both in terms of just the size of, of production in, in electric vehicles, uh, you know, there's been a lot of promise, too, in the sort of, you know, tech aspect uh, that, you know, it, there's, I think, uh, uh, an important question to be raised about, you know, whether the self-driving capabilities that mm -hmm. Musk has talked about are, are going to be realized, and okay. that, that may be an important uh, answer as well. Okay, something certainly to watch. Craig, thank you very much for that nice conversation to end the break around Bloomberg's Craig Trudell, cars are expert in all things auto. That is it for the early edition. More surveillance still ahead. They'll have a strong lineup of guests to take you through the corporate earnings season, also the macro themes around uh, gas supply to Europe, the looming ECB decision. This is Bloomberg.